This audio has been taken from the Citizens Archive of Pakistan's Oral History Project. He, he went by Golgi. His real, um, it was an artist name. Um, his actual name was Muhammad, what was it, Abdul Muhammad Ismaili. And um, he dropped those names and he took Golgi. Um, and the reason, he, and uh, he sort of, uh, sort of explained this to me that um, apparently in Peshawar, the first son is called Gul, and he took Golji. He was born in Peshawar. He went to Gora Gali uh, High School, uh, uh, and I remember, this is all through anecdotes that he told me that he, they would bully him a lot because he was smarter than the rest of them, but he wasn't that big, so they would bully him a lot. And he went to Gora Gali, and then I remember once he telling me this wonderful story that um, there were kids, and the Murray Mall back in the day, uh, um, uh, South Asians were not allowed on the mall. And he, st and he stood there and he like watched. They would go, all the kids would go and they would watch, all the Asian, South Asian kids would go, Pakistani kids would go, and they would hide in the sort of bushes and they'd watch the ladies and men walk through the mall. And I thought, oh, what a wonderful story that is. After that, I think he went to Aligarh and he taught engineering at age 22. Then he got a scholarship to Columbia uh, and um, for soil mechanics. And then he did further studies at Harvard for soil mechanics as well. So he went to Columbia and Harvard. He always wanted to be an artist. And I might have told the story before in my interview, but um, uh, the, it was planned for him to go to art school. He always wanted to be an artist. My great grandfather, I think, was a jewelry person or something. It was really weird. Like, I remember my grandmother coming to me and saying, Oh my God, you know, don't be a city de banana, you know? <laughs> and um, so, so the whole plan for him was to go to art school. When you're working um, for the British, you know, colonial sort of times, it's your upper middle class. You know, he had horses. He had a very comfortable lifestyle. There were, he was planning to go to art school. Um, my grandfather liked to preach. He was up in Hunza and Yogyakarta, those areas. And the British guy in charge, his boss, said, um, or the English guy, said, I'm sorry, you can't preach. And he said, but I'm doing it on my own time. He said, no, you can't do it. But my grandfather, being my grandfather, continued to preach. So he got fired. And he, the, and he was kind of blacklisted. So he didn't get another job for 13 years. And my father would say that he would, every time he'd get, he'd apply everywhere and he'd get rejection letters, but he'd always keep his head high. And um, so um, there were no um, scholarships for art at that time. And, um, and I remember the old Akhan, I think, told my father, Gulji, your country needs engineers. And so my father, and he needed a scholarship. Uh, so he went into engineering. And when, you know, the, for, the family fortune switched, when my grandfather couldn't get a job, suddenly they went from very comfortably upper middle class to no money kind of thing. And it was funny, um, later on, my grandfather kind of like stepped back from life. So my grandmother took over, she was the matriarch of the household. And I remember growing up that like my grandfather, and this is when he was much older, you know, he was much older and you know, my father was an artist and I must be 12. I mean, I was like 10 or seven, whatever, you know, and he, he'd never be judgmental. He'd, my, my grandmother would have a place in Purani Namash, which is by Kaidat and Mazar. It had wonderful sort of 1950s sort of houses or 40 houses there. And they had one of those houses. And he had a room in, 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 the, in, in the house and he never left his room. He never, he'd only walk to Jamaat Khana Every day, he'd walk there because the Jamal Khana is around the block. He'd walk back. And, and, you know, and as a kid, he was almost like a ghost. Like, my grandmother was very there, sort of like, I don't like your hair, I don't like this, I don't like that. But the, the grand, my grandfather was completely non judgmental and very gentle and, and didn't really want to interact and just wanted to be left alone in his room. And it was quite wonderful the way, like, uh, he was, he was the preacher man, right? He, he just wanted to preach. And then uh, the way he died was lovely too. 
where he walked uh, to Jamaat Thana and, um, you know, and then, you know, you take, you put on, you take off your shoes for prayers and then there's a place you go there to pick up your shoes. He put his shoes on, on the bench. He sat down, had a heart attack and was dead, died. So he died in the, I think, where else would he want to die, you know? And I, you know, um, yeah. I must have been 12 or I was young when he died. He, that's what he wanted to be. It was his passion to be an artist, Johnny. I mean, it was just circumstance that, you know, situation, circumstance that pushed him into engineering. And then he became kind of the head of his household. Because I think my grandfather proceeded into just sort of the spiritual realm, you know, of prayer. So my father became very much, you know, the, the you know, the leader of his family kind of thing, the male leader of his family. What he did was he, he taught himself. So what he would do, and he'd tell me this, that he'd go to museums extensively. His favorite was Rembrandt. That was his, his go-to guy. And he loved Rembrandt. And he would go and he'd go to museum after museum and, and he must have painted. He must have painted. Because you can't suddenly just, just, you know, like add water. He said he'd just go to museum after museum and study the works. Well, when you look at his early work, pointillism is certainly there. I mean, you can, you can see this, you know, this, you know, this sort of like pointillist aspect to his work. Uh, and um, he was a tremendous portraitist, uh, uh, tremendous, the way he modeled the face and just incredible. His portraiture was just incredible. Incredible, the way he used oils. So his mentors were the old masters. The paintings, the work, what he did was he studied what others had painted before him, the old masters of European art. And basically, his take-up point was not miniature, it was European painting. And he studied them. And he must have copied them. Because that's the way you really understand the work, is by copying it. But we, we don't have, I don't have any of those works or he didn't really talk about it. But that, those were his mentors. He didn't have a specific artist or something. Otherwise, no, not that he mentioned. I think his work was very much about himself. And where he was at a certain point in time, it was extremely personal. And the portraits, I mean, he must have... You can see the portraits he did of the Aga Khan or Yu Khan or, uh, you know, or uh, of Saranti, his grand dame from Lahore. Um, you can see that he really captures them. So there must be a, this great interaction between the subject and the artist. As a kid, I was happy to be by myself and, and to be left alone. And, you know, when somebody's painting, even, even as a child, I knew this is not a zone I should interrupt or enter. This is not my party. This is entrepreneur between the subject and the artist. And even as a kid, I remember that. And I just kind of watched from the sidelines. But I could see the chemistry between the painter and the subject. That I could see. It was so powerful. And you know, you just kind of like, you just shy away, you know, just, and I guess he must have been babysitting me for one of those times, because I was there for some reason, you know? And I just remember that so vividly, is the chemistry between, you know? And that was perhaps the only time I've witnessed, I, the only time I've witnessed him painting portrait was that one time with Afsarah. And you know, it was really wonderful. It was wonderful. Uh, and and Afsarah, she was very supportive of me. So um, I'd had my first show in Lahore and she bought a very large piece of mine and she placed it in a thing. And then as soon as we went there, he said, me, I mean, come with me. I said, okay, Dada. And we went around. He said, look at her. Isn't she beautiful? It was a portrait. It's, it's a small portrait. It was, and it was, and he looked at it. Just, oh, what a beautiful portrait. What a beautiful woman. And, and you can see the power. It wasn't just her as passive. It was her as powerful. There's, there's something about his he could really capture a certain, a spirit of the person. I was with him when, um, for the Islamic summit painting. Um, and that's, okay, so 
going back, um, and this is not, I mean, this is just stuff I know, uh, rather than being there as witness, is the person that was instrumental in his life was Elaine Hamilton, who came down as an American abstract expressionist. And I think she came down to Pakistan in the 60s or 70s. I'm not really sure which decade she came down. And me, she and my dad had this interaction that was really pivotal for him because he started abstraction at that point. And he moved into abstraction. I mean, he continued his, you know, his portraiture or whatever, but there was a shift towards abstraction. And then the other shift in my dad's career was calligraphy. Um, and this was when Bhutto was there, and he had the first Islamic summit in Lahore. Uh, and um, back in the day, this people were very interested, at least my parents were, in the idea of Islamic socialism as another world order as opposed to communism or capitalism. And uh, so I was there uh, in Lahore when he was doing this, uh, this piece. And um, it was his first calligraphic piece, and he had a slip disc. So he spent his entire time on his back. <laughs> so his painting was very kind of awkward. <laughs> and he had to sort of like, and he was in incredible amounts of pain, but he did it. And he went for his first umrah. And I remember him telling me about this. And he said, you know, and he said, you know, I mean, you know, I wrote in my diary, like, I'm going for umrah, and I don't know whether I'm going to feel anything or not. I have no idea if it's going to affect me at all or not. And it did. So when he came back, he started putting black spots in his paintings, in his abstractions, like the Hajri Aswad. These black areas would come into his paintings as kind of memory of, of his trip. I think it was very profound, personal, and powerful. You know, um, it comes from a source that's deep within. Um, it's not for export, it's for yourself. And that's why he was so skeptical about going to Umrah. Like, will I really make a connection? Will it really mean anything to me? Profoundly. I could tell it was very, uh, um, he was affected. And I think it was a long journey for him as well. Seeing my grandfather being sort of like blackballed for preaching and then sort of growing up in this household and, you know, going to America and like, um, you know, uh, I think it was a real journey for him. It was a real journey for him. And then once it started, it, it was my father. He was obsessive. So he started doing calligraphy and calligraphy and calligraphy. And then he wound up being able to write in all the great styles that were out. I mean, you have to understand, this guy's obsessive. It's not just ha ha me, Zarasa Karluga, you know, uh, obsessive. And that's all he did. And then, you know, it kind of seeped into his oil work, his abstract expressionism. But, you know, I'll, I'll show you examples of his classical calligraphy upstairs. And that's all he did. In fact, for the, for the convocation of uh, Yachan Hospital, they, he blindfolded himself and he, he sketched a tugra while the chap recited the particular verse from the Quran. And, you know, and he said, you know, it has to end when he ends and it all has to be timed right. And he did that, you know, just, I mean, he was just, yeah. He, with my father, he needed to have, the foundation was really important to him. So when he did portraiture, he wanted to study the old masters. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we need to kill it if he had to completely immerse himself within it. It couldn't be, he couldn't be superficial about it. He chose a lot of ayats. You know, uh, you know, uh, like for the Islamic summit, he chose the line, hold on to the rope of God and be together. Um, and then for a hospital, he said, God, you know, he chose a variety of ayats and uh, different scripts, and then there's one painting we have in the museum where it's combined a myriad of different Islamic scripts in one painting. You know, all tied together with abstract gestural calligraphy. Or not abstract, but like his gestural calligraphy.
In Karachi, I remember his Karachi shows because I was there. I mean, he had a couple of shows with Ali Imam. My father did not like shows. Um, and he had a few shows um, because most of his clientele were either heads of state, royalty, you know, uh, he went that way. So he didn't really show show. I think he had a couple of shows at Ali Imam's. And, and then he showed uh, the portrait of King Khalid in Lapis Lazuli because he did these Pietra Dora in mosaics in Lapis Lazuli at, <coughs> at the Arts Council. And I remember going there, the back in the day, out the Arts Council was uh, vibrant. And now it's resurrecting itself, which is wonderful. And it was there and he showed it there. And then he also did a painting, which is upstairs where he painted in front of an audience. There was a Belgium French artist uh, and they had two canvases, and large canvases, maybe, I don't know, 20 feet across or 25 feet across, you know, eight, nine feet high, you know, two canvases placed side by side. And it was in the Emmett Perways Hall upstairs. And I remember being there as a kid and um, so they started and it was to music. It was like over hours. Like I think they painted for five, six, seven hours and everybody watched. And initially I remember it was really funny where, I mean, there are two artists on right and left, my dad and this guy. And um, initially they would just kind of, you know, be very nice about going to each other's sides and contributing. And then sort of in the middle of it, it was became no, <laughs> my side and your side, <laughs> and was scraping away and like it's, it's, it's you know I, I, even as a kid I found that hilarious. It's just like no, my side, your side, <laughs> because someone gave him a challenge over there. Golji, can you paint with stone? He said yes, I can. I mean, it's my dad, so so he figured out a way, and it was a polychrome thing mosaic uh, portrait of Zaire Shah and um, using all the colors. And then after that, he went into Lapis. He did the old Aga Khan, a portrait of the old Aga Khan that uh, I remember the Aga Khan uh, visiting us in KDA and um, my father showed him the, <coughs> the portrait and um, he loved it and he said, and, but I remember him saying very clearly, Golji, this is brilliant. I want to have it. However, you have to tell me how much it costs and I have to pay you. I will not accept it for free. And I remember that very, very, very clearly. No, because I mean, at the end of the day, we are Ismailis. And if we are, you know, people will give anything to the Aga Khan. Uh, anything. And I thought, oh, how marvelous is that? That is marvelous. It's, it's marvelous. I think that's lovely. And he did. And, and I remember the day the portrait went to him. And, you know, my father was sad. And my mother was sad. I mean, these things mattered. And we went for a drive, you know, in KDA. And I was, you know, I mean, it just, it was, it was, they were sad about letting go of the portrait. And, um, and you know, one thing we're talking about my father who was most instrumental in his life. And even as a child, I mean, they were so unbelievably connected. I mean, she's 10 years uh, younger than my dad. Somebody pointed her out in Dhaka because they both were smiling. Look, Goji, she's Zaro, is Zareen, Goji, Zareen, whatever, Maladwal is down there. They look at each other. They met, he met her again in uh, in London after she'd finished. She got uh, she was the first Muslim girl of Bombay to get a scholarship to America. So she was there. She studied chemistry. She's ten years younger. She was in London. He was working for the Archon, I think, in Sweden. I'm not sure. And he met her in London, and he courted her. And she said, "Gulji, I'll marry you if the Archon marries us." And he was, he met the Aga Khan and the Aga Khan married them in Paris and, they, and she came to Pakistan. But, you know, and so they were a real partnership from get-go and I think that's when his artistic career also began. 
that's when the transition happened from engineer to artist. And uh, my mother, I remember her saying, I mean, I'm not going to cow out to Bigham Saibas. Not to me, like, you know, this anecdote, like, she, you know, I didn't want Guruji to compromise on his work. So she started Marble Crown. So she did this sort of mosaic flooring uh, for the defense mosque, the round mosque. She was mosaic flooring and tablecloths and stuff like that, the, co the cottage craft industry. So my father, so we could go to good schools and my father wouldn't have to be worried about selling a painting. And it would change over time. It would change. You could see his paintings and it would change. And I haven't really studied it. Uh, and it's up for somebody to study it, Gulji over the years and how the work evolves and different colors come in and um, how it changes, even the brush strokes and how everything changes. Before I know, the earlier work is easier to understand because he loved ultramarine blue, he loved olive green. I mean, those were the colors in his, you know, earlier abstractions, and then he just moved and moved. I think it was perhaps he was challenging himself from, you know, just moving through the color spectrum. But he did whatever, one thing my dad did was whatever he wanted to do. And he was the type of person who'd wake up and paint. He'd paint every day. And, um, and I remember, you know, you know, sometimes my mother would call me up and like, I mean, go over, you, you know, that is not painting. That would mean something is wrong. One thing I'm really proud of is I could make my parents laugh. You know, uh, it's, 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 you know, to make my dad laugh, it's like the best thing in the world for me. And he could put things in perspective. He really had the man on the mountain perspective. He really did. He was one of the least petty people I've met in my life. You know? He really had this sort of like really man on the mountain perspective. His painting was a whole operation, right? Because he's dealing with these huge brushes and the painting paint has to be mixed and it's the right consistency. And then because it's like watching a surgeon in action and does his work. Just so unbelievably precise. You know, it just, it's, it was mind blowing to watch him at play. Um, no, it, 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 these choices were not spontaneous. It was like, he chose the palette. He had these huge palettes the size of that table, maybe two big palettes. One chap constantly there to clean his brushes, to give him his palette lab to do whatever he wanted to do at that moment. And people would say, so Golgi, how long does it take you to paint a painting? He'd say 50 years. This 50 years has gone to the point where I can paint like this. You know, and um, so everything was planned. Now, I don't know where the transition happened. You know, like where the other colors started seeping in and how did they seep in and where did they come in from? That I don't know. And I think guessing, again, I'm guessing here. And this is, I wish you'd talk to my dad himself. I'm such a sad, like, you know, I feel terrible because ugh, it's best to ask him. Um, I think it was in very instinctive, intuitive, inside thing that it slowly evolved. Because you can see it, it slowly transitions away and another spectrum comes in. It slowly transitions away and another spectrum comes in. Then kind of takes over for a bit, for a bit. And then something else starts seeping in and then that will take over for a bit. You know, like emerald green sort of popped in for a bit, you know? And you can see it sort of starting and then it sort of takes over. And, um, and when I was growing up, my father would put a painting here, I would paint with him, you know? So I grew up with the smell of oil paints. And when we moved here, uh, so, you know, Nayir Ali Dada designed this beautiful studio for him, very good paint. But he didn't use that studio. He, that, he, that turned into a storage room. He picked the smallest room of that entire space, which is huge, to paint in. Like a cell. <laughs> but he did that even in KDA. <coughs> So my mother and father divided the house and gave one bedroom in the middle for me and my sister to share. On the left was my mother's space, on the right was my father's space. My father had this huge studio and a tiny bedroom. 
But he'd paint not in his studio. He'd paint in his bedroom. And which was like this little box, tiny little room. And, um, and so, so that's where he painted. He did not paint in the room that was assigned to, to paint in. And I, so kind of, you know, that's where he, he was, he was, he was really austere. And in his room, there would be just filing cabinets, one cot where he'd sleep in or rest on, and his easel bus, and of course, a huge uh, pallet, an enormous pallet, a table, you know, two tables with color on them. Watching him paint, I love to watch him paint, and you know, I didn't wa watch him when other people were watching him, because my father was very generous that way. He didn't mind people coming and watching him work. In fact, he loved it. So he'd have, and then, you know, with that, I'd always shy away, but he, he was with his clients or with his friends and painting, but, but, but I just do it when I, it was just me and him. First Islamic summit, when was that? 70s, right? I, I don't know. He, he's used mirror in that. Maybe that's where it started from. Maybe that's where it started from because he used gold leaf too. And he told me, I mean, gold is a color for us. Started my career. Um, I was like, you know, let's do father and son shows <laughs> because he had all the connections, right? I didn't have any, so um, uh, so he showed uh, in Riyadh. We had we had separate shows. He showed his work, I showed mine. Then uh, at the Commonwealth Institute, uh, we showed together, but it was primarily his show. I had a few pieces of the day, but the Father and Son show was primarily his work that Benazir Bhutto opened. And then, um, and then it was so funny. So I spent, I think I must be in my 20s, and I was in, in, in Washington, and I really wanted <coughs> a show. And I went to the Meridian International Center, which is the head, the ex headquarters of the Washington Post, and it's Catherine Graham's residence. It's turned into a museum in Washington. And um, and um, uh, and I was like, you know, and I talked to her, and I t she said, "Oh, we primarily only show paintings." I'm like, "Oh, my father's a painter. Why don't you show a few sculptures too?" And we we talked. I convinced her to give us a show. Well, what my father would do is, and then um, and then because you know the okay backtrack. Uh, the Akhan's wife, Salima, his, his first, his original wife, I remember her saying, Gulji, you should show at the Pompidou. I can get you a show at the Pompidou. He said, no, you know, I'm not ready. Maybe, you know, he was just, and for the Meridian Internationals. And so he, he, he just, the chance left. And for the Meridian International Center, I did all the footwork for it. It was primarily his show where I you know, pedestals. And, um, and I remember my father saying, no, let's postpone it. I'm not ready. And I told him, daddy, if you're not going to show, I'm going to go. I'm going to take three paintings of yours. I'll stick whichever paintings I want on the wall. And I'm doing the show because we can't postpone it. If we postpone it, we won't get another slot. As an ego, though, you know, like I'm going. So I forced him into that show. Uh, and he was really happy because the, the curator of the museum fell in love with my father, of course, and they would spend the entire time together. And then he got this rave review in the Washington Times where, you know, just this rave flow, glowing review. And it was great. And, you know, it was great. But it was, he was always reluctant to show, you know. He didn't, you know, he was really obsessed by his own self, a complete narcissist, like artist, you know, like what he was obsessed with is his next frigging canvas. Just his, his own sort of like journey, his path, his work. That was his sole obsession. But you could see the challenges. You could always see them. Why do you think I didn't want to be an artist? You know, I was witness to it. You know, the challenges, the disrespect, the, you know, initially the lack of money, you know. I mean, my parents, right? Gulji and Zaro, 
send me to Yale, send my sister to Brown, then buy her a house, then like send her to Thunderbird with me, give me trips to Europe. And when they had a ticker, they would share one chicken ticker. Even till the end, I'm like, guys, have a ticker. One each. Nay, beta, we are not so hungry. And that's how I grew up. It's hard. It's just so, you know, my dad was, I mean, I was incredibly close to both of them, but, you know, even like artist to artist, even if I wasn't his son or whatever, I mean, just such an incredible artist at the end of the day, you know, and I'm not saying it, I'm not sentimental, I'm not doing shu yo mira bali tabe, you know, like, I mean, never, we never had that relationship. He was my buddy, because he was so tired after like being a mentor to his brothers and sisters. To me, we were friends. This audio has been taken from the Citizens Archive of Pakistan's Oral History Project.